Uh, let's turn to Galatians chapter 5. Tonight I'm going to start a series of lessons on the one another uh, commands of the New Testament. We won't preach on all of them. You'll, tonight's an introduction to the lesson and we'll go, we'll go to several passages of Scripture, maybe not all of them. When I write down this many Scriptures, I know that probably I won't make it to all of them tonight. But I want to just kind of introduce the lesson tonight if I can. And uh, then I hope this uh, lesson will be a blessing and help to you and your walk with the Lord. And let's see the background of it scripturally in verse uh, 13 of Galatians 5. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 verse 13. And we'll read down through the, the end of the chapter there. Verse number 26. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Now that's not Paul. all Paul has to say about it. We could keep on reading into chapter 6 because he keeps talking about our responsibility toward one another. But I guess that every church, and I haven't been a member of one and haven't pastored one that hasn't had this kind kind of issue. There are always, because there are people, there are always relationship problems. That's the nature of it. Okay, I've teased for years and I'm, I've not, you don't hear me say it in even a joking way, but I teased for years. The ministry would be great if it weren't for people. Okay? And there is no ministry without people. Okay? These pews are absolutely <laughs> worthless when it comes to response. Never had, by the way, we've never had two pews get mad at one another. <laughs> never had them argue with one another. They don't do anything. They just sit here you know, and uh, kind of sponge off the atmosphere. It's about all they're good for. I never had any problem like that with any of the pews, but when you get people together, and it doesn't matter how many people, you can get two people together and have 14 opinions, especially if they're Baptist preachers. Okay. But uh, the truth is, you're always going to have problems with relationship. Discount the presence of sin. We're not talking about because somebody's wrong, somebody's right. Just misunderstandings. I mean, especially when you get to be our age, you, you really don't, can't really trust what you think people said. You know, you could get real offended just imagining what people said to you, right? If you can't hear them plainly. Right? And so just discounting the flesh, discounting sin, just being around other people, there's always room for misunderstanding. Uh, some days 
maybe you're not like this, but some days I'm more sensitive than other days. And some days I'm more callous than other days. Some days I really do give a rip, and other days I could care less. Or I couldn't care less, excuse me. So the truth is, that's the way all of us are. Now, you may not want to confess that, but you're not preaching, so you don't have to stand account for what I'm, for what I'm saying. But you know the truth of the matter is that barring sin and leaving sin out of the equation, any kind of misunderstanding can occur and can disturb the, the harmony and the unity of a local church. That's what Paul's dealing with in Galatians chapter 5. What has happened to them is they've been convinced by Judaizers of false doctrine. And it's not just false doctrine, because that, Paul here is dealing with, with faint things that have nothing to do with false doctrine. When he talks about the works of the flesh and contrasts them to the fruit of the Spirit, the works of the flesh have nothing to do with doctrine, nothing to do with, with the teaching of the Judaizers. This is obviously an issue that's taking place. Paul has now moved from what the Judaizers have taught him to an area of concern he has about what's going on in the church. And he's telling them, God called us to liberty, but don't use the liberty for the occasion to serve the flesh. They that are Christ, he said, have crucified the flesh with the affections of the flesh. So we as God's people need to understand that uh, the whole key to this chapter is found here in the conclusion, in verses 25 and 26, where he says, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory provoking one another, envying one another. Let's live in the Spirit and walk in the Spirit. Now, he said that in verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And then he says in verse 18, but if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. So we as God's people need to understand that our responsibility is to walk in the Spirit. And how do we do that? We do that by practicing the one another. He starts off that way. He starts off with them saying uh, that, Brethren, you've been called to liberty. Only use not liberty as an occasion of the flesh, but by love serve one another. By love serve one another. Now, I'm going to ask you a question, and you're not going to like the question. Okay, But I'm just going to ask you a question. When you go to a restaurant, okay, do you think... That being a waitress is like a high-level job? Hmm? Now, don't, I'm not trying to be a smart aleck, but waiting on tables is probably not close to rocket science. Now, it's a hard job. I mean, you have to be able to remember things. Mrs. Martin's told me several times she could never be a waitress because... She focuses on the last thing she heard. And my daughter April took after her. You could give April a list of four things to do. She'd do one of them, the one at the bottom, the one she heard last. She'd come back and say, what about the other three? Huh? Then you give her the three and give her the last one. She'd go do that. So it took four trips to get one job done. So she could never be a waitress, you know. But the truth is, we don't look at waiters and waitresses and think, now, boy, now this is the epitome when I grow up, that's what I want to do. Okay? They're serving us. You know, <coughs> excuse me, the reason we think that way is because we have a problem with P-R-I-D-E. Okay? And so Paul says, here in the church, you wait on me and I'll wait on you. You serve me, I'll serve you. By love. But then he contrasted, he says a little later here, <laughs> what a picture this is. <coughs> this is like Mark Twain told a story one time about two snakes he saw. And one snake had to hold the other snake's tail, and the other snake had to hold his tail. And they both got to swallow, and he said he went back there in a few minutes, they were both gone. Disappeared. Swallowed each other up. And that's what Paul's saying here. Paul says, right here, and what a, what, a, what a thing to say to people, right? If ye bite and devour one another. That sounds like a nursery instruction. 
No biting. But he's not talking to nursery babes. He's talking to us. He said, if you bite and, desire, and, and bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. Now, here he just said, by love serve one another. He said, now stop biting and devouring one another. Because if you're not careful, you're going to eat each other up. You're going to disappear like Mark Twain snakes. And you know, Doc, you've been in ministry long enough, and I've been in ministry long enough, that we've seen that happen, haven't we? Isn't that a shame? But we've seen it happen. We've seen people bite and devour one another and consume one another. It's a shame. It is. But it can happen. And Paul's warning them here. And then down at the bottom, he uses that one another word again. He says, let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. So it's obvious that these commands, and there are many of them in Scripture, one, one man counted a hundred of them. I'm not going to talk about all hundred of them, okay? Just rest your mind, okay? But, but there are several we're going to look at. But Paul, Paul here is telling us, if you'll practice the one another exhortations that are positive, and if you will ignore and avoid the negative one another passages, then you as God's people will edify rather than tear down. You will build up rather than destroy. Now, the one thing you're going to notice as we study these, they're not, they're not qualified. It doesn't say, love one another, by love serve one another if you feel like it. I didn't read that there, did you? It doesn't say, if you think it's your gift. I've had, that, I've had people tell me, that's not my gift. What is your gift? My gift is criticism. My gift is sarcasm. You know, what is your gift? Well, the Bible here doesn't say if you're gifted in that area. It says, do this. These are really called, ready? These are called commands. You say, well, we're not under law, preacher. We're under grace. But the Jesus said, if you love me, keep my... Yeah, these are grace commands. Now, the beauty of these, by the way, I'm going to share with you is that you can't do them. God has to do them through you. That's why he tells us we've got to walk in the Spirit. But these aren't qualified. These are commands. And these exhortations show us what it looks like to do the will of God. If you'll obey these commands of Scripture and avoid the negative aspects You'll be doing the will of God. You won't have to ask, what is the will of God? You'll, you'll automatically be walking in the will of God. Truth of the matter is that if we could learn to do that, um, we would carry out these instructions in our life in such a way that the very essence of what love is and living in the Spirit's all about would just glow off the church. Now, it's an amazing thing to me that in this passage, that Paul's talking to Christians. He's not talking to unbelievers. He's talking to believers. And he's saying there are some believers that are involved in the works of the flesh. And there are some who are involved in the fruit of the Spirit. It's quite a contrast between the two. And the Bible tells us in verse number 17 that these things are contrary, the one to the other. They are against one another. There's a marked difference between people who work the works of the flesh and people who bear the fruit of the Spirit. The works of the flesh are, are <coughs> primarily describing the lifestyles of the unbelieving. They're like walking according to the lawlessness and the disobedience of this world. And Paul warns us there, they that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I remind you again that the words are important. Paul said, there's a, there's a kingdom that can be inherited. Okay. I'm not talking about entering it. I'm talking about inheriting in it. You need to keep that clear. You can't enter the kingdom without being born again. But if these works of the flesh are evident in your life, you won't inherit in the kingdom. Now, that's a tough thought, but you need to understand, be not deceived. 
God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. A man sows to the flesh, of the flesh he reaps corruption. If he sows to the spirit, of the spirit he reaps life everlasting. That's in Galatians chapter 6, the next chapter. And so we need to understand that these lifestyles of the unbelieving are not to be in the lifestyle of a believer. We are to bear the fruit of the Spirit. So the Bible lays out these commands in a negative aspect and in a positive aspect. The works of the flesh are negative and the fruit of the Spirit is positive. And if you look at them that way, you'll see the contrast between the two. Now Paul lists them here in verse number 19. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murderers, murders, drunkenness, reveling. Seventeen of them. Seventeen evidences of the flesh work. And you and I can look at these and we can say, well, thank God I'm not as other men. You know, I haven't done that, I haven't done that. But you have to remember that the Lord Jesus has a different definition. There's a higher grace standard. Most of us think the grace standard is down here, but there's a high... Jesus said, you've heard it said in old times, but I say unto you. Remember that? The Sermon on the Mount. And so he has a higher standard. He said... These things, these 17 things <clears throat> can be done. There's such a thing as the Bible says in the book of James, there's such a thing as spiritual adultery. And we may not commit adultery after the flesh, but we could be committing it after the spirit. And fornication is a word that simply means moral impurity or uncleanness. And we could easily fall into that lifestyle as a believer. The famous Christians that we remember many times are the pastors, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> and the evangelists who have fallen into those sins. They didn't fall in them, by the way. Sin's not a pool that you walk by and trip into. Okay? It's a river that you walk out into step by step. And uh, so... Truthfully, we can be born again, and even those two that we look at and say, oh, that's terrible. Idolatry, witchcraft. Well, the Bible says rebellion and disobedience is the same as witchcraft as far as God's concerned. Amen? So these things are possible for believers to be involved in. So, therefore, God gives us some negative, some negative, you can tell them I haven't talked it, I haven't raised my voice in five days because... Here I am talking and I'm choking now. So at home it's so quiet, I tell you. Mm, forgive me. <clears throat> Maybe it's just my turn. Everybody else has been sick. It's my turn, okay? But the truth is, uh, as we read these passages, there are many negative number, negative uh, uh, commands. Let's go back to the book of Romans. Let's see if we can't possibly get through the negative ones tonight. I hate to just end there, but. That's the way it is sometimes. Romans chapter 1. Would you turn there with me? Romans chapter 1. <clears throat> now this is, a, Romans chapter 1 is that great chapter on the denigration and the degradation of the human race. When they turn their back on God starting in the Garden of Eden, it has not been ever onward and upward for the human race. It got so bad that in Noah's day, it had to be destroyed. And the truth of the matter is that if God, as uh, Leonard Ravenhill said, if God doesn't judge America before too long, he'll have to apologize to Sodom in the judgment. Mm, think about that. Here in this chapter we read about verse 27, Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Lusting one toward another. 
men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. Now, don't let anybody tell you that the Bible doesn't rebuke the sin of homosexuality. Okay? They, they just haven't read it. And that's, that's just God pointing out the facts. You don't read anything there. This, this, chapter was, this chapter was inspired by a God with a broken heart. Because he didn't create man to live as man's living today. He created man to be the vice regent of the universe. Not the off-scouring of the world. But as we read that, we find out here's, here's one command. Then go to chapter 14 of the same book. Now we're talking about the works of the flesh. Remember how it started off adultery, fornication, uncleanness. Now in chapter 14 and verse number 13. Paul is speaking to Christians again because notice the pronoun, let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Now, there's a great lesson there. We can, I know up in Pennsylvania now, maybe they know more scripture down here, but up in Pennsylvania they knew one verse. It showed up in the letters to the editor in the Lancaster New Era month after month after month. Matthew 7, 1. And they didn't, they didn't quote the whole verse, they just stopped with the first phrase. Judge not that you be not judged. And that's where they stopped. Okay? They didn't read for what, what judgment you judge or what measure you meet, it shall be meted to you again. The Lord said, make sure when you're judging, you judge righteous judgment. And this passage, he's not talking about righteous judgment again. He's talking about, about looking at somebody and saying, well, they... They're not serving God like I am. They're not as high up on the spiritual food chain as I am. And he's warning us that we all stand before one master. And so he warns us about that, that we not put a stumbling block in the way of our brothers. But it's possible as a child of God to be involved in that judgmental attitude. Oh me, amen. Chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians, chapter 7 and verse 5. <clears throat> the parallel passage to this is in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 6. You could look at that one, not tonight, but defrauding one another. Defraud ye not one the other except to be with consent for a time. This is talking about about uh, your attitude toward one another in the marriage, in the marriage vow, in the marriage commitment, physical act of marriage, and the same thing is true over in Second or First Thessalonians chapter four. He's talking about the same thing in the matter of defrauding by promising that which cannot be delivered, and defrauding has a greater meaning than just what Paul is talking about here. But he warns us not to defraud one another, not to lead. A people astray, not to promise something we won't deliver and can't deliver, not to flirt with the evil, not to flirt with the wrong. Be careful and circumspect in your relationships. You know. Um, then, of course, we read Galatians five fifteen. You can turn to Galatians because we'll look at. Uh, actually, we'll look. Go to Colossians because you remember the ones from Galatians five biting, devouring, and consuming one another, and then provoking and envying one another in chapter 5, verse 26. But in Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 9, we read another admonition regarding a negative aspect. Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 9, where the Bible pretty much said it very plainly, lie not one to another seeing you have put off the old man with his deeds. So another one, don't lie to one another. And then notice this one in Titus. Turn over a few more books toward Revelation and you get to Titus. Titus chapter 3 and verse number 3. Titus 3 and verse 3. <clears throat> Paul says, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, 
serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Hating one another. So the Bible warns us here, another work of the flesh has to do with hating one another. It goes even further in James, in James chapter 4, James chapter 4, <clears throat> verse number 11. James chapter 4 and verse number 11, where the Bible warns us about what we say about one another. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. And so here he's talking about slandering one another. And then in chapter 5 and verse number 9 of this same book, he says there in verse number 9, Grudge not one against another, brethren, unless ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth at the door. Boy, grudging. Can you, I, don't, I guess probably in Virginia they don't have that kind of thing going on in churches. But boy, up, up in Maryland, man, oh day, I, was, I heard about a church business meeting they had in Maryland, not too far from where I pastored, just over the line. I was only about five miles from Maryland there, 12, 12 miles, excuse me. And uh, down there in Maryland, they had a little church at a business meeting one night, and they, they adjourned the meeting because the fight got carried out into the parking lot. And I'm not talking about arguing with one another. I'm talking about they were going to Fist City. Now, I wish I could tell you that was a Methodist church, but it was an independent Baptist church, and they were fighting fisticuffs in the house of God, so they carried it out in the parking lot so they could really be wicked. You know? And we laugh about that, but you can imagine how the devils must have laughed about that. Okay? Yeah, yeah. They saw that going on in a church. The church I pastored in Pennsylvania, the year that, that they lost their pastor, the big business meeting they had where they got rid of the pastor and everything went, blew up, the Lancaster New Era came down and the, the county section, page number one, front page, the whole page, was all about the big fight they had at the Calvary Independent Church in Quarryville, Pennsylvania. Now, to be honest with you, Quarryville, Pennsylvania had 1,600 people in it. That's counting about 300 cows, I think. Okay? And so you can't tell me that what was going on there was that important, but boy, the devil wanted to hear about it. And they had all the details there about the accusations made against the pastor and by the associate pastor and then the accusations made against the associate pastor by the pastor. And by the time I, they called me to pay, they said, Preacher, you, they called, you went, why would you go pastor a church like that? I don't know. Just lucky, I guess. <laughs> God's sense of humor. Okay. And so I went there and boy, they, I mean, it was... And of course, me, you know, I'm, I'm so, I called people, I, all the people that left the church, I called them on the phone. And uh, so I, for two days, talking to people on the phone, I got cussed out by Christians. You know? And I said, I'm just trying to be a peacemaker. I'm just, you know, just trying to make peace if there's a possibility of peace among the brethren, I'm not trying to get you to come back to church. I'm just trying to get you to stop broadcasting the dirty laundry all over the county. That's all I'm trying to do. And man, then I was part of the problem. So, boy, it, it's a lot of fun to be a part of it. You say, well, Christians don't act that way. Well, God bless your sweetheart. I remember the first time we were in any kind of a struggle like that, my wife called her mother and said, Mom, all those years we grew up at Temple Baptist in Detroit, we never saw that. And mom said, honey, your dad was a deacon. We just didn't talk about it at home. That's why you didn't know about it. By the way, that's why she had such good parents. You know, they didn't talk about stuff like that at home. You know, that's why they raised such a good woman. But the truth is, yeah. These works of the flesh, they can go on anywhere. Now, I don't know about you, but I, in my spirit, Brother Mike, 
I get grieved thinking about stuff like that. Now, I wish I could tell you that, you know, that um, my whole life it has always been that way, but I remember as a boy. My dad was a pastor, and I remember as a boy the kind of things that went on, the kind of arguments we had, and the kind of fights that took place, the kind of meanness that God's people got involved. Do you know what a sorry testimony that is to the world outside? And so the whole point of what I'm saying is we need to say, well, thank God that ain't us. Well, but let's... Him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. Okay? And let's determine by God's grace, we're going to avoid these things. We're going to avoid these things like the plague. When we see them come about, we're going to say, not me. But they sure do reveal the work of the flesh. There's no question about it. Now, I want to stop here for just a minute and go back to Galatians. And I'm going to quit because it's time. Okay, Almost, I got... Four minutes till I have to stop, okay? So I'm going to just go back to the fifth chapter and I'm going to remind you again of what Paul said. Verse 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit. Verse 18, But if ye be led of the Spirit. Verse 25, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Do you know these... Uh, the Old Testament law was given and God gave with it no power to obey. But do you know the commands of Christ? Even the negative commands. God, through His Spirit, gives us the power to obey. That's what grace is really all about. Grace is not just the desire, but grace is the ability to do what God demands. What we have to do is to be led of the Spirit. To be led of the Spirit. When I was a boy, I used, to, I used to walk beside my dad. And I'd look and I'd take big steps trying to walk just as big as he did. Toward the end of my dad's life, I went to a... Uh, I went to a family reunion for the Campbells, my mom's people. They had it in Branson, Missouri. I probably am the only person who went to Branson, didn't go to one show. And it wasn't because of convictions, okay? We were too busy talking, catching up on old times. And I'm just going to tell you one thing that I remember, and I'll never forget from that, and I take it as a compliment, not an insult. My uncles were not there when I got there. Uncles and aunts, they were all out to eat, which is a Campbell thing, okay? And they drove back on the parking lot, and Celeste and I were walking down the parking lot, and Uncle Richard and Uncle Lee and Uncle Bobby pulled alongside us, and Uncle Bobby looked out and he said, I knew it was you, Dave. You walked just like your daddy. Wouldn't that be something if folks would say, I know those folks are Christian. They walk just like Jesus. That's what it means to walk, to be led, to follow the example of the Spirit. 